survived a massive overdose. Um, a little bit of background. I had reached age of 30 and had never tried hard drugs before, mostly because I was always taking care of somebody else, uh, being the only breadwinner, um, no children, because children don't need to be around, stuff like that. And uh, I helped raise my four younger siblings, so I was well acquainted with the type of care and attention children are supposed to have. Um, at the age of 30, I met somebody um, who prior to meeting me, um, made sure to let me know that they were a recovering opiate addict and had uh, been in therapy for 10 plus years and were as, uh, quote, sober as they wanted to be, unquote. And uh, I was cool with that. Um, I have always been experimental and had recently um, experimented a bit with some ketamine and some acid, um, both of which uh, I did privately and went well. I'm the type where I like to do something all by itself before I start mixing it with other things and I like to start low and then increase um, to gauge how it affects my body. Um, a couple of weeks after we met, uh, they procured some stuff uh, and said they were going to use and they were um, an injecting drug user. And I told them that I understood if uh, the answer was no, but that I was curious and I didn't want to make them feel like a freak show or anything because they're a person, um, you know, uh, but I asked them if I could watch. And they said that I could, and they explained each step as they did it. And I was very intrigued. Um, unlike most people, I don't have an aversion to needles, although I did when I was younger. Um, I had to have stitches twice, and uh, those memories are not fun ones. Uh, three to five, like, grown adults, like, leaning over me with needles uh, weren't fun. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that I did donate plasma when I was um, 18 and 19, and somehow... I don't know, I, I wasn't scared of needles after that, even though um, the plasma needles are huge and they blew out my veins in both my arms at the plasma place and that's why I quit doing it. Um, and also most people, I guess, don't know that at the plasma place, like they take your blood out and they spin it around the centrifuge and then they return your plasma to you minus your red blood cells. Like that's the second part of the process. And some people don't know that. and it kind of skews them out because they're like, yeah. Um, and also it's cold when it goes back in. Um, I tried it again a few years ago, but I wouldn't really recommend it uh, for the money you get versus, um, you know, what they charge for that plasma. But anyway, so after that, um, I knew that I probably would want to try um, injecting myself at some point. So, um, I didn't harp on it every day, but I made it clear that I would like to try this thing too. And, um, he, uh, tried to dissuade me and, uh, would say, you know, no, and I respected the no, but I explained, you know, I'll drop it for a bit, but, you know, I'll take your no for an answer, but I'm going to keep asking as time goes by. And eventually, um, he told me after probably about three months, uh, well, you can do it if you can hit yourself. And by that, he meant find a vein and successfully do it. Um, in other words, he wasn't going to do it for me, which I believe that if someone um, needs someone to do it for them, they probably don't want it that bad and they shouldn't be doing it. If you're not willing to do the work yourself, then you should stay away from it because there is nothing else to go to once you start injecting. It is the method with the highest bioavailability and uh, it's a bit harder to lie to yourself about a developing problem or addiction if you are injecting. Now people who smoke or take pills or um, do it other ways, um, I believe sometimes that that can contribute to a problem uh, lasting a longer time before they are honest with themselves about it because they can always say well at least I'm not like that person shooting up even if they're smoking every like two or three hours um, 
if you're honest with yourself, you know when it's a problem for you in your life and you shouldn't base that decision solely on the relative administration you use because I think that that is being facetious. Anyway, well, months later he told me that had he known how stubborn I was and persistent, he would never have said that to me because I value honesty above all else and I would not have done it and lied to him about it because I'd already been like, well, what if I do it somewhere else, you know, and just not around you and no. Um, but I would have stuck to my word and I know that about myself 100%. Now, I think it was a foregone conclusion because um, we got along and I would have kept asking and eventually uh, there would have been a night of a yes, and, but whatever. Uh, it was how it was. So then I got online and I did research and I watched videos and I looked at vein diagrams and I learned best practices. And I already was familiar um, with like giving animals their shots um, because living in the country, a lot of people would dump their animals and you can get um, shots from the feed store and just take them to the vet for their rabies shots and that saves a little bit of money sometimes. Um, so then I uh, got some supplies and I practiced and on my eighth try, I successfully um, registered with water. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history or her story. Um, although technically I am an ex on my driver's license, so it's their story, um, I guess. So um, by December 14th, 2018, um, we had used uh, cocaine a time or two, um, methamphetamine a couple of times and um, number three heroin a couple of times um, and had decent experiences. We hadn't yet um, gotten too far deep into any one thing. We were just kind of messing around maybe twice a month. If I had access to my uh, notes from the time, I would know for sure because I've always, uh, well, mostly logged my consumption for my own benefit um, in order to be able to tell like how much I was doing and the subjective effects. Um, something that I highly recommend because if you know exactly how much you're doing you can pretty quickly see if you're stepping it up or stepping it down. But anyway, December 14th, 2018. I had worked that day and then I attended a uh, staff Christmas party I had um, asked him if he wanted to go, but I would have had to leave and then go drive to get him and then come back, and he declined. He did go the next year, and we had a really good time. Um, we made out a little bit in the adult nonfiction, and um, we won some stuff uh, by guessing the number that is the answer to everything, which is 69. Um, it used to be 42, but it's 69 now, or maybe it always was. Um, and so after the holiday party, I procured uh, the stuff, which was to be uh, number four heroin, which you don't have to mix with citric acid to make water soluble. Um, and I debated going by the pharmacy and getting Narcan. I knew that it was a good idea to have it on hand just in case. Um, some people might feel as though it gives them an excuse to be less careful. Um, I'm not that kind. I knew it was something that should have been on hand and I was excited and I decided not to. Even though um, in Arkansas there is a standing order and anybody can go into a pharmacy and ask for Narcan and get it without having to go to a doctor. And if you're like me and on the Arkansas Works or Medicaid, um, often there's not even a copay. Um, so if you do opiates or if you know someone who does, prescription or not, um, go and get some Narcan. Just to have some to give to people if they need it. Um, but I didn't and I went uh, back to our home where uh, I had already been living with, with him for about six or seven months because basically as soon as we met, um, uh, within two weeks I was spending five nights out of seven there and I fully moved in within a few months um, even though I had always said I would never do that. Uh, sometimes you break your own rules. And uh, we got there and he looked at it and I, he was the more experienced one and he said it looked like, and this also should have tipped me off, that it looked like something called gray death that had come around a few years before and was really strong. Um, so. 
originally we made up he did a test shot and he said that it was really strong and the shot that uh, we had made up for me to possibly use um, he had me I am him with uh, intramuscular um, as opposed to going in the vein and then he made up one for me and then I believe even adjusted it down and I we were in the bathroom and I was standing in the closet and um, I administered it to myself and then I stood up and talked to him for several minutes and I didn't feel it really it was one of the first probably six seven times I had done an opiate and um, the first handful of times I ever did anything uh, IV I didn't feel a rush like most people say they do um, or it would be much delayed um, I'm not sure why. I think it takes the, the, the body and mind several exposures to get attuned to something. But that's just how I was at the time. Um, I talked to him for at least four to five minutes because I wanted to make sure that the, the margin of, uh, that enough time had passed where I could be relatively sure that I wasn't going to overdose. So after about four or five minutes, um, I walked from the closet door to the bathroom door and then it hit me and I felt it and I was like oh, okay I'm starting to feel it now and um, then he helped me walk over to the bed and I don't have a memory from halfway to the bed according to him I sat on the bed and then he went back into the bathroom um, to finish grooming or whatever and then he said that he heard a noise that was kind of like a snore and he went in there and saw that I had overdosed and he got me on the floor um, called 911 um, and started administering CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and that's something else is Arkansas has a law to where if someone is overdosing and somebody calls 911 then nobody can be arrested for simple possession um, I'm very lucky to have been with someone who knew that and somebody who cared about me um, because things have happened to other people um, who weren't in similar situations that turned out uh, much more tragically. And um, he said it took five to eight minutes probably for the first responders to get there and um, they only had one dose of Narcan. Uh, four milligrams and they gave it to me and um, they gave me the little um, manual thing to, to help me breathe that you use with your hand um, and they were saying that that was the last one that they had and um, he said that he basically gave up um, when I didn't come back from that like they had given me the four milligrams and um, uh, several minutes later no response <clears throat> and so he went um, from the bedroom into the uh, the living room at that point and then um, some more people got there who had another four milligrams and they gave me that and then I came up and my first memory was of waking up on my back looking at uh, police officers EMTs and I think maybe some firemen too and um, I pretty quickly deduced what must have happened because for me subjectively I remembered being in the bathroom and then black and then I'm on my back surrounded by official people I was like okay either I'm massively overdosed or this is a really weird version of heaven or hell um, so I'm gonna go with the most likely thing which is that I overdosed and immediately I was like so now let's try to do damage control because I mean I knew about the law too but I didn't want us to get into trouble um, so I erred on the side of keeping silent except when asked questions and um, they uh, then they started trying to get me to agree to go to the hospital and see I was still muzzy headed you know and I thought basically it was a trick. I was like, they're trying to get us apart so they can like question us and try to get us in trouble. Um, I don't know. Uh, my parents were a little bit on the, um, um, a little bit of, you know, question authority side um, and don't, don't necessarily trust that everything is for your, you know, your own best interest. Like remember the Fifth Amendment and all that. Um, so uh, I was not going to go to the hospital and apparently they went into the living room and were, told him they were like now look you know you got to convince her to go to the hospital because the way Narcan works 
is after about 30 minutes, the Narcan wears off. And if you have a massive enough overdose, then those opiates can attach to those receptors again. And I could have gone back down with an overdose 30 minutes later. And then, you know, they, they might've been out of Narcan, not been able to come back. And it, it would have been a waste of their time. Like I should have gone to the hospital. Um, but it was my first rodeo um, on that and last one, hopefully. Um, so when they had him come in there, um, I did agree to go to the hospital because he said that he thought that it was the best choice and I trusted his opinion on that. And I knew that he wouldn't lie to me um, about that. So um, I went and I uh, got, and, well, they took me out to the ambulance and in the ambulance, they gave me two more milligrams of Narcan. And um, then like a, an officer did come like asking me a few questions and mostly it was just like, um, are we going to have to deal with more of this tonight? Um, because he had told me that the way it usually works is because some people don't know you can only get so high and they just kind of keep increasing their tolerance. Um, if they hear of a bag that has put someone down, they'll try to swarm and get some of it, which that's really sad, um, I think. But um, the number one predictor, the number one predicting uh, factor of addiction is trauma, and um, mental health care is woefully underfunded, especially in the South. And uh, I don't judge people for how they deal with their pain, um, but I assured them that uh, no, that particular batch wasn't running around town, um, and I did not personally know what had become of the batch. Um, but they weren't going to have to deal with more overdoses because of it. And I felt confident in saying that. And then the EMT person, I guess maybe was just like, hey, if you want to question her, you can follow us to the hospital. Um, and they took me to Baptist Health in Little Rock. And uh, they treated me very well there. I was there for a couple of hours. Um, they made sure that you know I didn't go back under. And um, when I asked to be discharged, uh, it was probably around like 8.30 that I went down, probably about 9 when I got to the hospital. Um, I asked to be discharged a little bit after midnight because I was worried about him, um, you know, and I wanted to go home. And uh, they uh, passed on some information to me about um, like if I needed a Narcan prescription or if I needed like any referrals. And uh, they were very professional and nice there um, and then I got discharged and ended up getting an uber home because um, you know it was cold and I didn't want to walk and I hadn't driven myself and uh, he didn't have a car uh, to come and get me so um, and then I got home and I knocked on the door and like I had been worried until I uh, knocked on the door that um, he might have uh, like used um, alone and uh, like he's able to handle his stuff usually but I still was worried um, so I was very happy to see him when he opened the door and uh, I uh, updated him and um, we uh, went to bed together and um, <laughs> Opiates uh, make some people uh, more um, uh, horny, for lack of a better word. And um, also, it's a well-known thing that, um, like, there's a lot of motels next to funeral homes for a reason. It's like the, uh, the, uh, the life force um, wanting to uh, be like fighting against um, the forces of death or something. It's like a psychological thing where um, if someone has a near-death experience, um, sometimes they want to reaffirm um, that they're alive. And so um, I wanted to uh, reaffirm I was alive with him. And um, <laughs> I was just like, um, now bear in mind that I was intubated, so I may not be firing at 100%. <laughs> And, um, he just basically laughed and was like, you're fine, like, are you sure you want to do this? Um, because you were dead a few hours ago. And, um, I was sure. And, uh, we had, um, a very decent, uh, life-affirming session.
And um, then the next day, <laughs> I called in sick to work because um, I felt like my chest was a bit um, hurt a bit. And uh, I was glad that I did because basically for the next week, I had like bruises and um, I had to sleep on my side because between his CPR and um, the professional CPR, um, I think if I didn't have such a large rib cage and like strong bones, I probably would have had um, maybe a bruised or a broken rib possibly out of it because uh, they were working pretty hard to keep me alive. And um, <laughs> they did give me a chest x-ray at the hospital to check for it because I was already feeling a little bit of um, like pull in there. Um, but that is my story of how I... Uh, had a massive overdose and lived to tell to tell and um, I just hope that um, people will uh, bear in mind that um, things like that don't just happen on Rescue 911 or in the movies and um, it behooves everybody to learn a little bit about CPR and um, Good Samaritan laws and not be afraid to call the professionals in and um, there's a website uh, that has a phone number too called uh, Never Use Alone. And even if you are alone and don't have anybody that you trust, um, you can look that up.